Hi, this is Dane Quinn, and I'm at the University of Akron. And today I'd like to discuss degree of freedom. This is for engineering mechanics, fundamentals of mechanical vibrations. So, what is the degree of freedom? It's the minimum number of coordinates that are needed to specify the configuration of the system. So what do we mean by configuration? Well, essentially it's where the system is at. So down here I have given three different examples to illustrate the configuration of different systems. So in the first example here, right, I have a block that just slides along this inclined plane. Right? So essentially the direction of motion is kind of in this dashed line. And it only takes one measurement to specify where this block is relative to the ground. So you know a common one that we could use might be the displacement down the plane. Right? So if I say the origin is here, I am going to measure the location of this block relative to the origin down the plane. There's also a number of others, for example. I could go and say, well, I want to know the height of this block relative to some location, say y. If I tell you where the if I tell you the height, you can absolutely find out where this block is. So these are two different coordinates that can both be used to describe the configuration. The important thing is that I only need one. These two coordinates are dependent on one another. So because I only have one that I require, this is a one degree of freedom system. So let's look at the example to the right. So here we have a pendulum and in this case, if I kind of trace out the motion, it will swing along some arc. So just like before, I only need one coordinate. A common one and a convenient one that we might choose is the angle theta. So the angle theta is the angle of this pendulum relative to the vertical axis. There are lots of other ones. I could tell you essentially how far this pendulum has moved to the left or right or up and down. I could define different angles, uh, but again, I only need one coordinate. So once again, this pendulum is a one degree of freedom system. And the important thing here is that it's the number of independent coordinates. Again, as we've seen, particularly this first example, I could have a number of different coordinates that I chose to measure, but the degree of freedom is the number of independent coordinates that we need to specify the configuration. So here, if I take an example of a ball or a disk on a surface, I could actually define two coordinates. Right? One of them might be, let's say, the location of the center of the disk. We'll call that x. And then I could also define the rotation of this disk. Notice that I haven't said anything at all about how these things roll or how this disk rolls along the ground. If the system rolls without slip, then these two coordinates are related once again. So in particular, if we were to compare the velocities of, of the mass center, uh, let's say that's G, and the point of contact down here is point C, we would find that x dot, so the velocity in the horizontal direction, is minus r times theta dot, and so x is equal to minus r theta. Again, these two coordinates are dependent, right? They're related on one another. But if the system is slipping, so the contact velocity at point C is non-zero, then x dot is not equal to r, well, minus r theta dot. 
So in this first case, we would have a one degree of freedom system. While in the second case, we would need actually two coordinates. I'd need to know the horizontal displacement of the disk and I need to know the rotation of the disk as well in order to tell you exactly where all the material points of the disk were occupying at that specific instant in time. So again, I would need two coordinates and so it's a two degree of freedom system. So the number of coordinates depends on the constraints, depends on the object, depends on the kinds of motion that we have. And so let's look at a little more complicated example now. So here I have a disc that's pinned at the center to the ground. Uh, there's a spring that's attached to an inner hub. A cable's wrapped around this outer hub and to that cable is attached a spring and a mass is suspended from, from the other end of that spring. So in this case, this would be a two degree of freedom system. because I could measure the angular rotation of this disk, but fixing that is not enough to tell me where the block is. I'd also need a second coordinate to describe where the block is. So in terms of like the coordinates that I could measure, again, I could measure the angular rotation of this disk. That would be a good coordinate. Uh, I could measure, say, the position of this block with respect to the ground, right? I could call that X maybe. But there are lots of other coordinates that we could measure as well for this system. Uh, for example, I could come along and decide to measure the stretch in this spring, right? So that could be Y. Uh, other things, I could measure the stretch in this spring. Uh, let's call that Z. And then, of course, I could measure how far this point moves down, right? Call that W. So, look, I've got one, two, three, four, five different coordinates. Now, only two of these are independent because a lot of these are related one to another. In particular, if I look at Y and theta, we can show that Y is equal to R over 2 times theta. Also, W and theta are related. Right? So W here is equal to R times theta. So if you know any one of these three, Y, theta, or W, then you can find the other two. Those are not, that's not a, a, an independent set. So we can only choose one of these three. And then, if I look at these other two coordinates, we see that X and W and Z are related, right? So here X, the total displacement with respect to the ground is the displacement of the upper end of this part of the cable plus the stretch in the cable, right? So these are related by a constraint equation. So now we can use any two coordinates as long as they're independent, can be used to describe the configuration of this system. So again, we'll note that these y, w, and theta are dependent. So I could only use one of those as well as one of either X or Z. So again, for example, a good set of coordinates might be theta and X. But also a good set of coordinates could be Y and Z. Those are also independent. So when we're modeling systems, right, and in particular as we come to multi-degree of freedom systems, we have a lot of flexibility about how we choose the coordinates to describe our system. But it will be important for us to 
know what the degree of freedom is because that will tell us a lot about the size of the resulting set of equations. If it's a one degree of freedom system, we've seen that we end up with one equation, right? something like mx double dot plus bx dot plus kx equals zero. If it's a two degree of freedom system, then we'll end up with two equations. So again, knowing something about the degree of freedom, which we can determine at the beginning, will give us some guidance into our modeling and how far we need to go with our equations. So that's a little introduction to degree of freedom, and I will see you again. Thanks. Bye.